Welcome to Embedded. I am Elisio White alongside Christopher White. We've talked about Memfault, we've mentioned Reno.io and maybe UbiDots and Goliath and Particle. And I have just discovered these are all Pokemon <laughs> and that we need to collect them all. Uh, and Jonathan Berry is going to help us unravel which one will win at which Pokemon Towers. Is that right? Uh, maybe if the, if the Pokemon have antennas in their tails. More seriously, we're going to talk about the Internet of Things and the tools that we can get around the Internet of Things. They are not, in fact, Pokemon. How are you doing, Jonathan? Welcome back. Thanks. Great to be here. Could you tell us about yourself as if you weren't on a show 200 episodes ago? Uh, yeah, quickly about me. Um, my name is Jonathan Berry. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Goliath, an IoT platform company. But I've been in embedded IoT for the last, I don't know, decade or so at big companies like Google Nest, at tiny companies like Particle, because they're not so tiny anymore. Um, and yeah, started Goliath in, this, in a similar space. All right. And we're going to ask about Goliath, but we are also going to ask about a lot of other things. But before that, we want to do lightning round. Are you ready? Yes. Complete one project or start a dozen? Definitely start two dozen. <laughs> what does the S in IoT stand for? Uh, well, generally not security. Um, <laughs> sometimes I, I like to say sane defaults, but that doesn't quite ring, have the same ring. What is your favorite video game? Favorite video game? Oh. Pokemon? <laughs> <laughs> Should we bring back the dinosaurs? Five movies tells us no. If you had your own podcast, who would you want to be as a guest and what would you ask them? Oh, I wasn't prepared for any of these lightning round questions. Um, <laughs> I would have a fictional guest. Um, Jean-Luc Picard. And grooming tips. <laughs> uh, we may have asked this the last time you were on, but we can go check to see what if you give a different answer this time. Favorite fictional robot? I probably have a different answer every time that question is asked, but probably Lieutenant Commander Data going on the Star Trek theme. And one last one. Do you have a tip everyone should know? My, I, I remember my tip from last time. Which is still very valid, but I'll, uh, which was uh, don't cross the red and, and black wires. <laughs> Things <laughs> still go boom. valid. Yes, uh, I think this time it's more. Once you get the bootloader working, don't change it. <laughs> yes. And and might I add, don't put too much in the bootloader. <laughs> yes, and don't look at my PR that I just filed yesterday, which has too much in the bootloader. When we last talked to you, you worked at Particle. What does Particle do? Particle is an IoT platform. They are a full stack solution. So you can buy a component, whether a dev board or module from them. That includes the operating system, the software up update capabilities, um, connectivity. So if you are building a cellular product, they even give you a SIM. And then the tools to manage those devices. And now you have founded a company called Goliath. Uh, what do they do? Similar space. We help hardware companies who are designing internet connected devices by providing those capabilities like software updates, secure communication, but in a, a different approach um, where we say, hey, you've got your chip, you've got your, your, your sort of vendor of choice, your product is working. Now, how can we help connect that device online? but in a way that's working with the components you've chosen or the operating systems you want to use in a little bit more bring-your-own-device kind of way. And uh, the, our approach to that problem space is, let's look at an IoT device, and we'll definitely go into IoT, yeah, I'm sure. And the cloud parts of that are very complicated, very specific, and, and hard, a lot, especially for hardware companies. So can we be that, that team who's figured that all out? What does the cloud, what do you need from the cloud? And let's provide that. So kind of a longer answer than uh, slightly different. So I've been doing embedded systems for what seems like forever. 
but isn't. Um, I, I definitely started after networks, but I went to several companies who were building various IoT devices, as we would call them now, who would start with the idea that they should build their own radios or their own GPS receivers. Uh-huh. And when I would go, I would be like, no, maybe we should buy those. Even though they seem super expensive, we should maybe do whatever it is you wanted to do. But we would still have to run our own servers, um, build our own bootloaders, update our own firmware, monitor devices for system health and why they crashed and whether or not the bug that they have actually has to do with something crawling inside the box because Boston has salt fogs. All of this was from scratch. Sometimes it was in assembly even. But now there are tools for all that. There are so many tools. Where? Okay, we have Memfault. Do you remember what Memfault does, Christopher? Yes. Okay, t- t- tell me, tell me, tell me. I'll uh, record it and insert it here. <laughs> after this show. Uh, Memfault does uh, a lot of diagnostic stuff and and capture a lot of uh, telemetry and things from IoT devices, if I remember correctly. So they provide infrastructure so that you can uh, have your device and have it send in a compact way statistics and things, as well as firmware update um, things. But they didn't Terrible, actually... But... They didn't care about the data. It was all about the operations aspect. Yes, from my memory. And Jonathan Goliath provides, you just said, and I've already, I'm like, I don't know where that fits in. It's not AWS. AWS provides like... I think it is on top of AWS. So if you want to do IoT, and I'm going to stop talking, let Jonathan talk in a second. If you want to do IoT, if you do it from scratch, then yes, you, you put a bunch of stuff in front of AWS, but that's a lot of hard work. You don't just connect AWS to your device. I think maybe Goliath is the thing that makes all that easier. Do I have that right? Yeah, yeah. And it's it's going back to, you know, what is what does an IoT device need from the cloud? And you could totally build everything that Memfault and Goliath and Renode um, does yourself. But <laughs> I feel from, like I have. <laughs> Yeah, like like many people have. I mean, in Nest, we had everything from scratch. Uh, even the way we use databases predates a lot of the capabilities that um, Amazon has today. But when you're talking about a product, for the most part, those things are actually not part of your business. It's not core to your to to sort of the value you create. Because you know, if you're building a smoke detector, safety, reliability, user notifications, that's your product. Great hardware reliable sensors, that's your product. The things in the middle, the things that go into developing your, your product, the things to monitoring your device, uh, your product, the things to making sure that you can scale your product, again, is not part of your the thing your business wants to build and, and hopefully we will be successful with. And so what to, to your original point, over time, more and more people have realized that, whether it's coming from the open source world or commercial offerings like, like Lyoth and Memfall, or that should be a commodity. If you really wish that you wouldn't have to Start with, okay, let's, let's write our own assembly bootloader, then bring in our own IP stack, and then write a custom driver with our modem vendor. And then, okay, now we have to figure out security and communication and encoding. And then, okay, well, now we have a database. I haven't even built the mobile app yet. So how do we go from have a, a chip on our desk to having that you know, end product? Um, and that's where a lot of the solutions of space have started to you know, be developed and show up over the last you know, five, five, ten years. It's sort of parallel to IT where five or 10, well, probably more like 10 or 15 years ago, if you were at a company, you had a server room. It was packed with servers and you had an IT department that was tasked with managing those servers and everybody's files, you know, went on those for the company. And, and now nobody does that. Yeah. Like, right? yeah. It's all elsewhere and managed by some other company because if I'm running a company that makes X, uh, running a data center shouldn't be necessarily part of X. Yeah, exactly. You know, why why does most companies use Gmail for their email server, right? There's no you doesn't help your business by running your own SMTP server anymore. What? Um this is so true, but it's hard to understand the landscape. And to some extent, it's easier for me to explain to managers and clients what they have to do to make it work instead of trying to figure out 
which company I should be recommending and whether or not I believe it will exist in a year. Which company should I be recommending and which ones won't exist in a year? Yeah, and, and I mean, I think the, there's a third question there is, you know, what, what do you need from the cloud? Um, and the, you know, not everything is an IoT device and not all IoT devices are created equally and, and don't have the same requirements. Um, as an example, um, I met with a large consumer device manufacturer last year and they have a lighting solution. And they're very much privacy focused and their customers don't really want to use a you know, cloud service. Mm-hmm. And so by design, they made sure that their lights and light switches just work and they get paired in the factory and there's a mobile app for some minor tweaking, but it doesn't talk to the cloud mostly. I say mostly because they have a, let's say, compliance requirement to have the ability to software update those devices in case there's a vulnerability or in case there is a major feature that they want to push out, but they plan never to use it. And so going from, hey, I have an offline you know, you know, wireless link between two devices to now I have to be able to push a firmware update to millions of devices sometimes is this huge lift. And so I call it sprinkling, on, sprinkling a little IoT. Um, it's just as hard as building a you know, full-fledged IoT system. Well, that company has to figure out OTA and fleet management and being able to push signed firmware uh, binaries down to a subset of devices, to 100% of devices, et cetera. And for them, they just need to go figure out the OTA problem and have a solution versus a, let's say, a um, agriculture a product which needs to sense a lot of different sensors all in near real time, combine that with weather data and location data and you know, other telemetry from third-party vendors. They have a whole other set of problems. And so it's, it's, it's hard, it's messy, it's complicated. And, 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 but first, really... It's useful to figure out or to determine, or even just to ask, <laughs> to figure out what questions to ask. What do I need from the cloud as part of my IoT solution and what, what don't? Because that, that will help you figure out which vendors in the space actually serve your needs. Okay, so OTA, over the air, firmware update. That's one giant feature that many people don't expect the complexity of, even though we talk about security and how important it is not to create bricks, it's still something that gets tacked on at the very end of projects. You forget to have enough flash on your device for you know, AB updates and uh, didn't have, choose the right component with uh, hardware accelerated cryptography, so you can't actually do the OTA fast. Yeah, so usually it happens too late in the process, but... Another thing that happens often very late in the project is realizing that you need to manage the device. You need heartbeats to figure out if the devices are still out there and you need them to check in to see if they need to be updated. You may need debug ability um, so that when you do send out firmware updates, you know that their batteries are dying or there's more crashing of this kind. This whole, what I'm saying, the operations side. And then you need some, maybe you need to uh, command something, you know, Maybe the agriculture device needs to command something that says, uh, tell the farmer to turn on the water. Or maybe the farmer says, okay, now I want you to turn on the water, and it commands down to the device. So there's this command and control, and it can go either way. And then there's, and that, that most people get. Most people say, okay, I understand what that's for, and I understand why my product would need it. But the first thing most people think about are the data streams, we, we, the sensors, where are they going? Which way do they go? And, um, and how, do I, how do I collect that data? Are there other things I'm missing here? Uh, well, so you're definitely right. The, the data is usually the first thing and, and sometimes the only thing, um, let's say, companies think about as it relates to the IoT device because that's where the value is it is, right? Uh, maybe it, there's, there's an aspect of command and control, but um, how they get the data, how much data they're going to have, how they're going to store it. But these other elements are really part of the early phases of the product development lifecycle, as well as the operations of the uh, product development lifecycle. But those, those are kind of the, the main things. I would say the, the different phases, you might actually be using different tools. Like um, we talked about uh, observability, 
monitoring the device, like the things that Memfault does really well. Um, that's great for when you're initially developing your, your, your solution, but also as you operate the device. Um, and some things are actually even more important at the development phase versus the operation phase. Um, so you know, being able to test at scale. Um, well, there are companies that help with, in the cloud, let's say scaling out your, your virtualized tests. Like Reno is an example of a, of a tool that helps you do um, development in the cloud or assist you developing with, with, with the cloud capabilities. Uh, but those kind of four things you hit on, which you can probably you know, drill in if we want to go a little bit deeper, but you know, device management, that sort of command and control, the data, and really just you know, inter- interfacing with, with other systems. Yeah, that's probably the last one that we didn't touch on because sometimes you have to talk to other systems. Maybe it's a, another team in your cloud um, application team or your mobile team, um, and we can call that data, but it's actually quite a different problem because if you get a raw sensor reading, right, let's say you have an accelerometer, you get its raw values, you might send that to the cloud, denormalize it into actual you know, coordinates. Well, the application team who's trying to show the tilt of a trash can on a mobile app has to then process that in something else. And that goes into the cloud, the general cloud world. Um, and so there's some tie-in between the world of device and sort of device management, device data, and the world of application and application data. So there's that bridge. Uh, Renode, R-E-N-O-D-E. I think it's Renode. Dot I-O. Mm-hmm. They do simulations. They do, they don't solve any of these problems, actually. Is that right? Well, they actually solve a, a, good, a good chunk of these problems. So I, I was talking about the, the role of the cloud. And I, I've started this uh, mini series that I call the clouds of IoT. And it's probably a good framework for us to talk about. Um, and you're, you're giving me flack before we started that I haven't finished the plug series. <laughs> I, I, it's coming, it's coming. Um, it was a great but, start. And then I was like, okay, what about the other four? Um, but go ahead, talk about, talk about it, please. And it's trying to debunk part of this, these challenges you're, you're asking about, is that there's not just a air quotes cloud. It's not just someone else's machine, right? But the capabilities of a solution that is enabled through the cloud for IoT is actually specialized. And I, I talked about five different types of clouds. And, I, and to, to be very clear, there might be one company that does more than one of these clouds, but I, at least I try to point to one ex- specific example or two specific examples. And so Goliath and Particle and a few others uh, in the space are what I would call a device cloud. That's the thing that helps you connect the cloud to the internet, security, the software updates, the thing that you, you, know, you as a firmware engineer might be using on a regular basis while you're in the prototyping phase, when you're in the pilot phase, even operating a device at scale, pushing new firmware, that's the device stuff. And so that's what you know, a lot of the conversations end up um, talking about when we talk about OTA, and et cetera. But there are other types of clouds that are part of a solution. And um, I mentioned um, the connectivity cloud is another kind of cloud. And uh, we, can, we can double click on, on that. I'll, I'll list the rest before, uh, before we go on in more detail. Um, what I would call the data and data cloud uh, I'll kind of rattle these off a little bit faster so it's not taking too long. Uh, application cloud and the development cloud. And as an example, um, a connectivity cloud. So if you're building a cellular-based device, you might need a SIM provider, like an MNO and MVNO. Think Verizon or Hologram. If you're building an application, so a mobile app or a dashboard, you might use tools like Node-RED or Blink or Ubidots. Um And a development cloud is a tool that helps you in the initial phases of development and through the development lifecycle as you continue to iterate on your, your product. So yeah, I would uh, I categorize Memfault in the development cloud. It's a key part of writing your firmware, testing your firmware, doing new releases that is actually made better because the cloud exists versus having a similar tool on your desktop that you would you know, batch, download, I don't know, log files, and then try to process those locally. You know, that's just a completely different kind of user experience than having a real-time tool that can aggregate all that information and make use of it. So those are the five clouds, device, connectivity, data app, and development, in no particular order. Okay, uh, Ubidots and, and Red somethings. Uh, Node-RED. Node-RED. Where do they fit in? So what they help you do is, well, they, they kind of overlap. 
um, data and apps tend to kind of share because first you need to be able to collect all the IoT data and then you need to be able to use, um, create dashboards, mobile apps, et cetera. So Noterit is a great tool for taking in sensor data or other sources of data with a low code experience, a lot of time IoT, and then process it so it can be averaged or summarized or reformatted so it's more compatible with, let's say, your dashboarding tool like uh, like UberDots. So Grafana, where I can just graph things, would fit in there? Yeah, and it's, it's, it's uh, actually pretty common. We see it a lot these days for the application. So when we talk about application, it could be anything from, hey, is the data coming in and can I see it on a chart to I'm literally building an, a native Android and iOS tool. And Grafana is definitely an, you know, an app builder for a lot, of, a lot of companies, especially if you're not building a consumer product where there's a installer or a product manager or a building manager, as an example. They just need that dashboard. Grafana would, would fall in that, that category. And the data cloud, is that just always AWS and Azure and whatever Google canceled last week? <laughs> uh, yes, and you know, and this is where we're starting to get into that. Well, some companies do multiple things. Mm-hmm. Like AWS IoT has some device cloud capabilities, device management, software updates, but they of course have a huge swath of stuff around data processing and data storage. Um, but there's a lot of IoT specific databases. So in general, IoT sensors tend to be time stamped, so we call them time series databases. And there's companies like InfluxDB or Timescale DB. They build specialized databases that are extremely efficient, easy to store the sort of sensor based data, but also easy to query it for you know, visualization or, or later use. And so a bunch of companies make these optimized data databases for things like time series data. Is there? Um... It seems like Amazon has, to a certain extent, owned a large chunk of this market with AWS, at least the the, the data storage market. Um, is there a way to spread the risk if you're an IoT company and say, well, I don't want to put all my eggs in an AWS basket in, in case the Cascadia fault breaks? Um, or, or do you kind of have to choose, okay, this is where my stuff's going and that's just the way life is if that company screws up and loses my data? Yes and no. Um, the... You know, there's, there's a standards problem in IoT, as, as we're all familiar, but it's not as the same. When we talk about standards, we talk about like data standards and how you know, your Google device for Google Home can't talk to your Alexa. What I mean by that more is the way that you build a device for AWS IoT is fundamentally different than you'd build it for Azure IoT or right. for Goliath or for anything you built yourself from homegrown. So the portability across different vendors uh, makes that challenge. You know? Some solutions like Goliath can work on multiple cloud providers. So if you build for that one thing, at least that it can run in multiple places. But all in all, each IoT project, for the most part, is kind of a snowflake, even if it's doing a very similar thing to the nearest nearest competitor. And so if you take on a whole uh, uh, all-in solution, let's say you build vertically on AWS, well, you can't really run that against Azure IoT. So either you you pick solutions that are designed to have sort of multi multi environments, which there aren't that many, um, or you pick some of the pieces. So uh, a lot of companies that I've come across who let's say use AWS for their IoT product, they might just use AWS's database, and then they wrote a lot of they hired a big team and they wrote a lot of their own IoT device management on top of AWS, not depending on their solution because of that that key factor. Like they want to use a database that's high availability and, and cost effective. That same database might be running also on Azure because it's a standardized database, but that's the only real way, except for, again, a couple of solutions like Goliath that is designed so that it can be portable. But yeah, this, there's that baked-in challenge for most solutions. Is it baked into operating systems as well? I mean, I know AWS has a free RTOS branch, and I think Goliath likes Zephyr, which is... I'm liking Zephyr more every time I see it. And Azure has ThreadX. ThreadX. I, yeah. yep. I mean, do I have to... I'm starting an IoT project. Do if, I, I choose yeah. my, if I choose one thing, does that mean I've chosen everything? So those are two, there's actually a couple good questions in there. Um, and I'll start with my recommendation for anyone who's starting an IoT project. Start with your component. What chip do you want to use? What radio technology do you want to use? 
get that vendor down. And each vendor has you know, made their own bet at the, at the OS level. And generally speaking, those vendors have you know, FAEs that will support you on the firmware side and the hardware uh, architecture design side, and they've partnered with the cloud parts. So they have middleware components that you can drag and drop and, and pull in. So for example, if, if you're using um, Infineon with Modus Toolbox uh, or MCS Expresso from NXP, and you're starting a project, you're going to have the, you know, the ideal software SDK starting experience. And they have multiple RTOSs in there too, by the way, um, for the most part. And the middleware is the thing you can swap in and out. So before you get too far along into your development, you can build upon well-tested and support, the key thing, supported middleware. And for, for the most part, you actually get some, some choice. Now, um, the how vertically integrated that OS and middleware is will kind of make it a little bit harder. So, um, for example, if you're trying to use AWS, if you started with, let's say, the cloud side, if you were to pick AWS IoT and, and try to um, design your hardware from there, well, if you're really proficient in embed, you're, you're kind of you're kind of stuck. Uh, I have a friend who who who's built an IoT product, and they chose AWS IoT, and their dev shop chose Embed OS, and the two shall never meet. Nine months later, they didn't ship their product, and they had to scratch the entire um, uh, V1 of the solution. Move on to another another platform. So if you if you start with the OS and the hardware, find which one you're going to get the best support, then go from the middleware up. That makes it a little easier for you to design, you know, design your solution. And you know, I mentioned Infineon and most toolbox. They support free RTOS and Zephyr today, so you can actually go with the software that's you know most you're most comfortable with, or maybe meet the timing requirements or whatever, and then pick from a growing number of cloud solutions from there. Um, we actually, uh, we, of course, um, you mentioned Zephyr. We're big fans of Zephyr, but I mean, the real driver for for us. The reason why we like it so much, it's a good RTOS and has you know good kernel and, and, and drivers, et cetera. But the key, and maybe may sound a little bit repetitive, is that vendor support for Zephyr. And so we know that if customers using an NXP part with Zephyr, we know the FAE who maintains that, SD, that SDK and integration and that we can you know, find bugs, whether it's our bugs or their bugs, and, and, and have that resolution. So... IoT is such a complicated thing. You want to reduce as many variables of complexity and find the most amount of support you can. Picking that that hardware OS is usually going to give you the happiest path, and then adding the cloud on top of it um, will just continue to reduce those, you know, areas where things can go awry. I have a, a napkin sketch for a internet-enabled fishbowl, and I don't write code. And I don't want to know about firmware updates. Is there a completely vertical, uh, integrated, <laughs> vertically integrated solution so that my fish can talk to me while I'm at work? Yeah. Um, so there are projects and there are products. That's something very important to keep in mind. You know, I'm, I'm a maker. I, I build hobby projects on the weekends. But I've also worked on products that have you know, supply chain and design for manufacturing and Lots of customer support and all the other things. And so the category of things you could build for projects, there's actually a huge ecosystem in the maker community. Um, and we're seeing a little bit more of that makery low, let's say, technical effort making its way into finished products or tools for creating finished products. But by and large, almost every product I've ever worked on or customers I've ever worked with, they have a C, C++ developer, they have a hardware and loop testing lab. You know, they, they are you know, doing... You know, Manufacturing with a CM, where things that are low code and, and low friction for, let's say, non engineers to design and develop, um, really fall in the, the category of um, makers, educators, etc. Um, and there are solutions for sure that uh, that are great. Uh, you know, there's tools like Blockly, which uh, have been integrated in, in projects like um, the, the BBC Microbit. Um, but we're starting to see more of that kind of let's say, drag and drop or don't require you to write C code and things like Arduino, um, the Arduino Cloud um, IoT platform. They have the ability to design a solution and actually generate the code for you. And under the covers, it's uh, Arduino and C++, um, which, is, which is pretty neat stuff. But if you're thinking about making 10,000 of those fish bowls, you probably want to start there, get the solution with a vertically integrated product, and then 
find someone who can design a PCB or a breakout board, write some firmware, think about the OTA because one, it may not be secure, <laughs> it may not be scalable, and it may not be cost effective. And so it's a good place to start, but certainly I haven't seen a lot in the productizable realm yet. You made a good point that, that trying to, and this this is something that is philosophically where I am as an engineer, is try to make things as easy as possible for yourself. Don't reinvent the wheel. Don't go off re-implementing things that other people have implemented. Try to find solutions that are, quote, you know, not your job, not part of your product elsewhere. Um, are there pitfalls and shiny objects that people need to watch out for that can drag you away from the uh, <laughs> from the easy path because they look like a great idea. Have you seen a lot of that kind of thing where somebody's like, "Oh, I saw you know this new technology and it, and I'm going to go for it." Um, how, how do you how do you advise people to be cautious about what they're implementing? Well, I think um, there are there there are shiny objects all the time in 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 software i think programming languages as as one of those examples um you know there is amazing stuff happening in micropython and rust um and there are people actually starting to ship product with those but if you're trying to build you know consumer grade iot product are you going to be able to find 30 rust developers who know the you know tokyo real time stack and be able to interface with the networking it's 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 that tends to be a, a challenge um, and so uh, i go back to what is the what is the prescribed path what is the happy path with the most amount of support whether that's from the chip you bought and the vendor who makes it and the support team they offer you as part of your being a customer to the modems and the, the other forms of connectivity are there stacks that you can just grab as opposed to you know, finding other challenges? Because IoT is the, probably the culmination of most of, of software, right? It's hardware, it's embedded firmware, it's networking, it's modems, it's connectivity, it's security, it's infrastructure, it's servers, it's databases. Applications. <laughs> just, yes, mobile apps. Everything. Cool. Yeah. And so if you can just um, circle around the path of least resistance, you're just going to be more successful because it's there's so many places where you can either get lost or confused or or, or uh, fail really. And you choose based on the device first. Yeah, the the I would actually say choose on the product first. So that fishbowl example, you know, is is there going to be a consumer product? Is it going to be in an aquarium? Is it going to be a Vegas ho- hotel? Who's going to operate it? Um, is there does it need to have a cons- one con- one controller? Multiple people controlling it. Is it part of a larger system? And um, you know, it, uh, a consumer electronics company who might do what's called a um, MRD, a market research document, understanding the landscape of how people use products today, what would existing solutions and how people interact with them. And from there, you can start to pan out or build out what kind of connectivity do we need? What kind of on-device com- um, computing do we need? Do we have to interface with other devices locally, over the internet, over some other transport? And from this pyramid of figuring out what you're trying to build as, as the product, you can start to develop that sort of roadmap of the, the hardware design, the firmware design, the, what kind of connectivity in cloud. And of those five clouds, what do we actually care about? What do we actually need in our solution? And not just pull on something because it's shiny and new or it's, uh, it's someone told you to use it. I mean, I totally agree with you. It's I like the way you've broken this up because... The device cloud is an area where I spend a lot of time. And then usually I have a UART or something that goes to the connectivity cloud, which might be BLE, it might be uh, 2.4 gigahertz radios, it might be cell modems. And for the most part, I don't care. Those, Those are very separate things. And what I talk to after that, yeah, I mean, it's fine. And then whoever, and then as the clouds go up, you know, the application cloud, Sure. As long as the data gets to the data cloud, I don't care what you do with the application cloud, as long as I can understand that my device is working correctly. And really that goes back to the development cloud, where somewhere between the device cloud and the development cloud, I know my devices are being updated. I know my devices are alive and that they are performing as they as their self-test indicates they should. But who wants to plan anything? 
I mean, nobody wants to plan anything. Everybody just seems to want solutions or to write it themselves. Yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting. I, I did a, a Twitter survey a few months back um, about sensor drivers and uh, you know, free RTOS is a kernel uh, and their distributions of that kernel. I found out that most of the distributions don't include sensor drivers. So like um, Espressif has the ESPIDF, which is based on the free RTOS kernel, and they've brought in a bunch of stuff to make it really easy to use free RTOS. But every single person who uses the um, Espressif um, ESPIDF writes their own sensor drivers. You know, it's a little I2C here and a little uh, accelerometer there, um, which, you know, when I asked why people do is, I've always done that <laughs> um, versus grabbing a library of uh, well tested sensor interface from maybe the sensor manufacturer. And so I think there's. Wait, those exist? Where? Some do. Um, some do. Or there are different operating systems include those. So, like Zephyr mm. has a whole sensor library with sure. a bunch of um, sensors provided by some of the sensor makers. But for example, Bosch has a bunch of sensor drivers, and some of them are actually optimized uh, and, and, and lo and behold, actually performant. Um, but people still end up writing their own Bosch you know, BME 680 sensor driver from scratch. And maybe that's just the way some people are wired, and uh, there's not much you can do about it. Um, but if you would have you know, looked around and maybe uh, surveyed the ecosystem, those early decisions, that planning, maybe you picked in a solution that had some of that already built in that you didn't have to focus on those things that you were doing over and over again with every project. I think that's one of the things embedded systems is going to be changing in the next five to 10 years is that we're going to start figuring out that we can't keep writing the same. Please don't make me write another accelerometer driver. I mean, I haven't written a UART driver in years. Right. And before UART, that, <laughs> UART's at least are I mean, well, well I used covered. to write, you know, one or two a year. And now it's usually, I don't have to do that. But I'm tired of writing display systems and... Well, even the display, I mean, yeah, it's it's a it's a mixed landscape. There's, there's and like, I, I think you're right, Jonathan. You, you, when you're planning out your hardware in order to walk that path of, of, of making it easy on yourself, picking hardware that you don't have to write a bunch of software that is not part of your product's job. <laughs> nobody, nobody, nobody bought your internet connected fishbowl because it had a custom spy driver for the light. Yes. <laughs> and, and there's there's things that do matter, um, especially in the world of IoT. Even a lot of applications are, say, power sensitive mm-hmm. or memory memory yeah. sensitive. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of the companies we work with, they spend a lot of time on power management and actually taking the device driver they got, it was working, and they were optimizing the driver. That's one is you know more interesting and, and relevant to your product, but two, um, <laughs> sometimes more fun depending on the DNA of of, of the of the engineer. So. It's better to spend time on those kind of things as opposed to doing the defaults, you know, pull off the I2C buffer, re- read it, throw, dump it on the UART, and then, oh, yeah, cool, that works. Okay. So cloud layers, I think I have them. And data that we talked about initially goes pretty well into these cloud layers. Device management goes to the device cloud. Um, it might go also into the data cloud but it definitely comes from the device cloud. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And then we have um, the data stream, which comes from the device cloud through the connectivity cloud into the data cloud, and then probably the application cloud does something with it. Yeah. Yeah. And so if we talk about actual put in some place, some place things instead of just general names, um, Let's say I want to talk about the data, um, the data stream, and I'm going to choose Goliath because I'm talking to you, and it seems rude to choose Particle at this point. What happens next? What, what, where, which connectivity cloud should I use? What does going to Goliath mean? Does that mean that I also have to use some other piece? This is this is where I got to say it depends. <laughs> Of course it does. I get I get that one card right, uh, and it really does depend on the product and the company, because um, a lot of products 
there might be already engineers to that company. There might be already building mobile apps. So you probably want your mobile team to have access to that, that data coming off the sensor and just let them run with it. Um, but if you're a consultant and you're working on a, with an entrepreneur who has a great business idea, you're designing the, the PCB and some of the firmware, you kind of don't have that resource. So you want something that's super well integrated with wherever the data is coming off of, and you can just go it and, and drag and drop and, and do what you need on the visualization piece. And so we see a lot of mix. Um, and if you're not building a cellular device or a lower device or anything with a managed connectivity, you don't even need to worry about connectivity cloud, right? You're building a Bluetooth app or you're doing something on Ethernet or Wi-Fi, and you can just cross that, that, that part of the stack altogether. And so if we go back to you know, your fishbowl example, your fishbowl monitoring example, it's probably, um, I don't know, some pH sensor in the fishbowl, maybe some turbidity to measure the activity of the fish. I don't know. Um, and you want to stream that data and show it on a mobile app. So maybe it's a good example to use as a, as a framework. So you have picked your, your, your Wi-Fi components and the sensors and you wrote some firmware and you have your UART plugged aside and you're seeing the, the data there. And so... The, probably the most commonality across all these um, types of products, and the, whether it depends, is some form of device management. So being able to connect that device to the internet, so it has a cir- secure communication. Instead of having it on your UART, maybe you have it on our log output in the cloud, and you're like, cool, this is connected to the internet. Now I want to test out OTA, so I build a new image, push it through the device management solution, and you see it instead of you know, blinking red, it blinks, uh, blinks the green LED. Great, OTA works. And now I need to show to my investor or my, uh, I don't know, my, my, my uh, business partner, the values coming off that device. It's like, oh, log output's interesting, but let me, um, let me just grab Grafana dashboard, wire up the data from the, you know, the sensor, the streaming information, and then show the, the pH levels rising and falling or the turbidity as you kind of twirl the water around there. And so that's your, that's your prototype. And uh, that kind of checks off some of the boxes. Uh, and as you go from that prototype to, let's say, a pilot, there's a lot, a lot of other things have to happen. Um, but fundamentally, you're just building on what you started. Maybe you replace Grafana with a web app that the subcontractor built out. And that's taking the data from you know, your, your device management like Goliath and then dumping it into... Um, a web app instead of a you know, Grafana dashboard. And then maybe you decide that you want to have a outdoor fishbowl so you have a swap out of components and you, you now have a cellular device instead of a Wi-Fi device. It's like, okay, now I have to go find my connectivity provider, bring that in, and these two SKUs, one's the Wi-Fi, one is the cellular, one has connectivity, one doesn't, and you can start you know, continuing to refine the product. At some point, usually in that pilot phase, you have all the cloud parts figured out. Who, who's, who's doing what if you're using a third-party vendor, let's say Grafana, or if the web developer built your own dashboard, whether you need connectivity or you don't. Um, your device manager is probably plugged in from the, early on. And um, the rest is product development, right? new, new features and firmware, testing, changing from a Adafruit Feather board to a custom PCB. Um, but the, I think one of the key things is there's a certain point where you don't have to make any of these decisions anymore because you've figured it all out and now it's just matched to whatever those initial product requirements were. I'm always afraid of that. I mean, what if I chose wrong? What if I chose Sigfox? <laughs> to what now? And what if I had a LoRa device? I wanted it to be super low power. And because, you know, everybody else was using the Things network. I was sure it was going to succeed, but now I have a device and I can't talk to it anymore because I chose the wrong connectivity or I chose a data cloud that doesn't exist anymore. That's why you put eight different radios on every product so you can adapt as necessary. Yeah, and, and I think one of the things um, that has changed, we talked a little bit about the changes in embedded and how um, reuse is becoming, moving towards uh Common, commonplace. Um, just the ability to prototype as a professional engineer has also changed significantly. Oh yes, right. You you can actually build 
a working prototype with dev boards and breadboards, and it will be a lookalike. You know, RF might be different in power, but at that phase, unless you have a very specific application, you're not optimizing for those things. You want to know, does this work? Does the idea pan out? Can I build it with these basic components? And, you know, choosing flexibility around the software you're using. So let's say, um, we talked about operating system earlier, having one that will allow you to, let's say, swap out a cellular AT modem for a Wi-Fi AT modem. Those kind of things can help you at least reduce the risk at that phase. And in some ways, even further down the road, as you get to, we, we deployed our first hundred se- you know, sensors in the field, it's like, shoot, I need to do OTA, and LoRaWAN doesn't support OTA. What am I going to do? Um, that low-cost, almost low-cost um, prototyping phase, you can go back one step without a significant, crazy amount of cost versus, you know, man- you have to manufacture the full thing with enclosures, with IP ratings, you know, with FCC, and then find out when you have your first thousand in the field, oh, shoot, I can't get through a metal box. I should have thought about that earlier. I should have got <laughs> with plastic. So I think those tools, um, whether it's the cloud-enabled versions of, or um, counterparts, or just you know, where we've gone with debuggers and developers and IDEs and you know, just cheap commodity sensors that you can easily wire in, um, makes, makes it a little bit, little bit easier, a little bit um, less scary, but still risky. I was teaching uh, my making embedded systems class today and their homework was to make Blinky work. And when they heard that last week, I'm pretty sure there were, I could hear their eyes rolling. It's like, make Blinky. Everybody's made Blinky. That's dumb. And then today when they had to answer the questions of, okay, did you step through the code? What uh, compiler did you use? Did you use one of the hardware abstraction layers? Are you using a, uh, an RTOS? Um, did you use the class board or something else? And suddenly the tooling becomes so much harder than the development, than the engineering. I mean, the tooling is engineering. I shouldn't say it that way because that makes it sound like it isn't. It totally is. But it's the part of the engineering problem that we don't always remember. And I feel like we're hitting that with these, uh, with the different clouds that, okay, it's all there and I might be able to put it all together once, but I don't know that I could put it together in a way that I could be confident it would still go together that way in a month or put it together in a way that I'm confident somebody else could put it together with my notes. It's, it's a tooling problem right now. Is that, do you see that as well? Or is, is that just me not knowing the landscape? Uh, no, I, I think the tooling problem is one of the things holding embedded back. Um, I, I really enjoyed uh, Tyler from Mfault when he was talking about the analogy that a lot of large software companies have engineers dedicated just to make tooling better to make those engineers uh, highly productive. There was a humongous group at Google just building internal tools for code completion, for code sharing, for continuous integration and, and deployment. And you can see that. Uh, I remember this is now uh, a lifetime ago, um, there was a public API we wanted to develop. And a single engineer could build that e- public API. For all the code, configured it, and deployed it on a global scale. And that's only possible because of the tens of thousands of hours from hundreds of engineers who built the tooling to make that possible. And we don't really have that. Um, and I think you know, we can pontificate of why in the better world that's the case. But there's at least one component that I, I, I feel pretty strongly about um, is because even though there were teams of embedded engineers, the embedded work was mostly individual. Like you were running your driver, you're integrating into some you know, uh, code repository, but the tools that you interact with are the thing at your desk, the code on your screen, the IDE that's configured in your environment. And as we, you know, as modern software practices have made things more distributed, but also it's a complex system of even things that you don't even know exist yet or haven't been built yet, that doesn't work anymore. 
Um, and, you know, things like modern development tools uh, that we are seeing in the you know, classic web server and mobile application are slowly trickling in to embedded. Um, and, and I mean tools here, I mean more, you know, uh, more of the um, standard definition, like an ID, a compiler, a debugger. Um, but also the things around those tools, like observability for what's happening on your device at your desk or in the field, or how to uh, get a packet off of a UART into a database and all the things in between. Um, we're still getting those sort of more classic tools to be improved, like Visual Studio Code. Um, when, when, I used, when I was working at Particle, uh, we launched a plugin for Visual Studio Code, and no one was doing UART out, like terminal output from a, a physical device. And so figuring out how to plug into, you know, a slash dev slash gt0 on, on the Linux machine and then show the, the log output from a, a particle device was actually really novel at the time and hard to do and hard to repeat and wasn't reusable because it was tied to that specific platform. Um, but now, like, Microsoft has a team building embedded tools for Visual Studio Code. Things like step debugging for different operating systems, for real-time operating systems, things like terminal output and, uh, yeah, we're, we're slowly getting there, um, and I think the tools around the IoT parts for that for that part of of the embedded world is also catching up, like Memfault, like we know, like Eli and and others. So many people are used to rolling their own because they control all of the pieces, which means they don't have to worry about a company going out of business, which I think is a a common fear. How do you as Goliath CEO say, no, no, we'll be here next month and get people to believe that. How do, as an engineer, on the other hand, how do you figure out when to trust a cloud service? Oh, those are, those are two, three, three good questions. Um, <laughs> and I think part of it is just some of the things that are happening in the IT space. So specifically IT, not, not talking about Goliath yet. Um, like open source is a thing now, <laughs> and leveraging open source has actually been a big part of our uh, of our company and our product. Which I would say, ten years ago, we couldn't have built some of the things that we wanted to build um, that we we could build today because of leveraging open source. And that's both on the device side, but also a lot of stuff we do in the cloud. And um, like our approach to interfacing with device side firmware through the RTOSs is, is we just have a little library, so. Um, you can look at our little library and see all the code that's there and all the interaction points. And if you need to design Goliath out, you can just take that library, figure out what we're doing, and swap us out. You know, it doesn't prevent us from going out of business, but it certainly prevents the risk of you uh, being stuck with a service that no longer works. And on the other side of the uh, of the let's say the UART is the cloud communication and the security and other things that we talk about. Um, our approach to the de- device management, device cl- device connectivity, security, all those other pieces is using open standards. Um, either open, open source standards or open standards that are defined by big groups of PhDs. And so we document all of our APIs on the cloud side. And it, you can go on our website and see our reference information, and you could literally reproduce what we're doing from the device to cloud communication. And so the device side is open source, the cloud communication is open, is open and documented. If we went out of business, we, would, we could show people today how to design us out so that you can limp along until you, you you design your own solution. And so that's like worst case scenario, which people want to hear. But from a business perspective, and, and when we have these conversations, especially with larger companies, they don't, they're, they're, they have those concerns, not just an engineer from a business perspective, and they don't want to build a device management platform, again, because it's not part of their core product and it doesn't create value. But they need to be able to control it they need to be able to understand it and they need to be able to you know, communicate that to their end customers. And so by you know, part of our, our product has an enterprise version. So we can run a version dedicated just for your company on Azure, on Google, on an oil refinery if you uh, had your own data, data server there. And that allows them to have that control without having to basically build a Goliath-sized company. Um, and those between the openness of our solution and the ability to actually run it themselves without having to build it themselves is how we mitigate some of that. And so it doesn't, doesn't make any, everyone feel good uh, or, or uh, answer all those questions, but at least it's different than the you know, 
lots of IoT companies today, especially consumer ones, they just run out of funding because they built something proprietary and did it from scratch. Literally, their gateway devices, their lighting controllers just stop working. That's at least our, that's our answer. So as an engineering side, how do I avoid vendor lock-in for my IoT tooling? Is it even worth bothering to worry about that? Or do I just figure out what my company needs and not worry you about... Three abstraction layers. Yeah. How many abstraction layers do I need? There's, there's, a, there's a fine line, of course, because the more abstractions you, you have, the harder it is to maintain. Probably performance gets impacted. But what I usually recommend, or the analogy I usually give when I talk to engineers as opposed to the business person, is... When you're designing a PCB, you have a keep out zone, right? To deal with issues like, oh, what if, what if there's a component shortage and I need to redesign my PCB? Uh, do I have to redesign the whole thing or just swap out the modem? Or if you're building, you know, writing some firmware, you don't have to create your own HAL abstraction layer on top of a HAL abstraction layer, but maybe modulize your code a little bit. Um, and that's, that's probably good practice. And I would say best practice. And, and because at the end of the day, the more effort you put into buffering from, uh, let's say, the chance that there's a solution that no longer works or you have to redesign somewhere in the future, well, you really just, you can't abstract, you can't spend all your time writing that abstraction. Um, so if you can pre- prevent the inevitable redesign, if, if, that's, if you're afraid of that, without having to you know, <laughs> spend as much time preventing that through abstraction layers than you are writing firmware code, you're, you're doing it wrong and you really have to strike that balance. Um, and the, the the secret and this is I'll tell this to your listeners um, about IoT products is they're actually pretty simple. All this complexity we talk about the the thing that's happening on the device or the thing that's related to the IoT parts is actually usually pretty simple. And, and you know things you know other companies t- take care of it like your module vendor doing the modem is probably handling security and, and certificates and network packets. But the actual thing you're doing is probably just reading a you know reading a sensor taking the sensor data. And then sending it to a UART. And that piece can probably be redesigned if you really need to without too much, too much pain. It's no, the actual application, the firmware, the logic, the algorithms, the power management, all the things that's your product, your code, your, your innovation, that's always going to be complicated. And that's where the, the time she spent. But that IoT part actually tends to be pretty, pretty simple and the, the, least, the least amount of places you have to worry about. It's where scaling and large numbers of units come in, that it comes back to being a device problem, that getting a bug uh, report that says unit number 1,012 crashed, that's not actionable. Uh-huh. Um, so that comes back to device management. Does uh, Goliath do any of that? We do a bit. Um, you know, we've we decided to to focus on our our swim lane, which is connecting device, securing device, making sure they're online and healthy. Um, but things like understanding the firmware um, and what's going on on the particular light device at the stack or heap, um, we don't do. Um, that's where like folks like Memfault do really well, and kind of where we stop and they start. Um, we see a lot of folks using those those solutions together, actually. I kind of feel like I need a map of, you know, those cartoon maps that are for <laughs> tourist cities. And over here is the application cloud, and these are the stores and restaurants over there. And here's the device cloud, and here are the stores and restaurants over here. And look, there's a little road that goes between them. I think you need to do a whole book of understanding embedded systems through maps. Okay. Didn't you do a, a great design of oh. the memory maps? Yes, yes, yes. exactly. Yeah, I, I had that visual in my head of IT <laughs> products and solutions. Uh, yes, if somebody could make my memory map land, but instead for IoT solutions, that would be awesome. And then we can have the ocean of, of AWS, and it can have little ports along the areas that it needs to touch. And free RTOS can be like the planes. Anyway, um, so you you were a product manager with and did some code for a Particle, but now you are CEO. How's that gig going? How is it different? Well, you both run your own companies. 
And I would say I spend a lot more time running a company than I am product managing or writing code. <laughs> Things like payroll, insurance, and weird laws between states, because we're, we're a remote first company. Uh, but you know that part aside, it's just been kind of fun to scratch the itch and build a team and work with some great people. Um, it's not for everyone, because you know, Saturday, and I'm probably going to get off this podcast and do some emails, but uh, I, think it, I think it's worth it. And you've built a pretty fun team, it looked like. Indeed. And let's see, one more question. Um, what are the best and worst uses of IoT that you have seen so far? <laughs> uh, Is that a listener question? No, oh, okay. but I think maybe they asked what was the worst, but I added what was the best because you can't just have the internet of fish bowls. It's a fishy example. Well, it's, it's worth calling out. There's a Twitter account, uh, the internet, um, where they, they literally have an internet connected toilet with uh, health monitoring capabilities. I'll leave it, leave it uh, for the listeners to look up what that means. Um, the My rule of thumb for connecting a device to the internet is it should be better than if it wasn't. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't in, take away the features because you've added the internet and want me to pay for them every month instead of just the once. Or yeah, or actually make it perform worse because now you have to have a two X size battery to deal with the Wi-Fi radio you put on there, and it literally does the exact same thing that it was doing without internet. You just created a dashboard, and I think except except now you have to update the firmware every six months randomly. Hopefully, there's a firmware update every six months. You're not stuck with uh, a t- terrible device. Yeah, <laughs> I would say that the, so. My general rule of thumb is something that senses something in the world that you wouldn't have knowledge of otherwise. Um, something that provides automation or uh, a meaningful enhancement of convenience. And I'll kind of try to describe those. Um, or let's say does something really cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, like um, with that farming example we used in, er, earlier, right? You have no idea how much UV, how, how much rainfall is, or, or, or moisture is happening to a crop at any form of scale without having some sort of sensor there. And with the cost and, and sort of deployability of uh, sensors, you now have insight into your crops that you never have before, except for having, sending someone else to like put their thumb into the the ground, but you still wouldn't know about those UV. So that actually improves crop yield and pr- crop health and reduces environmental waste on water and other, you know, uh, rolling out uh, trucks to go, or, or tractors to go check on those things. Um, so getting information which you couldn't get otherwise, I think is, is my favorite use case of um, IoT. And, you know, this idea of convenience, not just, hey, I'm sitting on my couch, I want to turn, off, turn on my lights. I like consumer products all together, but um, being able to monitor things that you couldn't easily send a truck out to. Um, talk about waste management, elevator monitoring, uh, street lighting poles, windmills, or sorry, wind, wind, wind generators. It's really expensive to send someone up there, like thousands of dollars. And instead, is, is the generator working? Thumbs up, great. We don't have to spend, uh, you know, send someone out there, dangerous, trip, whatever. So, um, those are those are my two general use cases of when I think about okay this is this is IoT making devices better products better our environment better. Um, I just think of cool things like I don't know particle accelerators and being able to uh, beam form crazy stuff and in the convenience of you know the upstairs lab and um, where yeah you could have a you know a PhD sit there with a dial and move things around but um, being able to have that. Remote control experience. Um, I think it's just those are, there's there's fun examples. Um, there's a there's a ex- example that um, Zach, the the CEO of Particle, used to always uh, bring up, which I also agree is a terrible use case. There's a a basketball from basketball company, um, <laughs> and it was a Bluetooth monitor to with an accelerometer, so you can like monitor your shots. But they had to put the Bluetooth radio and the accelerometer somewhere, so they put it at the you know, bottom of the, the ball. Well, if you dribble the ball and it hits on the sensor, it just, one, breaks the sensor, and two, doesn't bounce back. So you've literally made a basketball not a basketball anymore. 
So it's just, uh, you know, figuring out where it can enhance that versus. Yes, make things better. Jonathan, it's been really good to talk to you. Uh, do you have any thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think IoT is such a fascinating space. It's obviously what I spend a lot of my time and my career on, but it's complicated. And if, you, if your listeners are thinking, wow, there's so much stuff I got to learn and, and figure out, it's like, yes, that, it, that's, that's what makes it both enjoyable but also complex. And the, the advice I give is find resources, like, whether it's your um, if you're working with a chipset vendor, get some help because they have engineers who are help, helpful. There's online communities. There's very active Slack, like Embedded and, and Interrupt, as well as Discords that are popping up all the time. And local enthusiasts who are bridging the divide between Embedded and hardware and connectivity. Um, because you know, we can figure this out. Like We see people shipping products all the time. And um, just know that if you feel overwhelmed, it's not just you. It's, it's, a, it's a vast and complicated space, but uh, there are people here to help you figure it out. And so if you want to collect all of the Pokemon that are the IoT tools companies, you should search the internet for IoT Pokemon. I, don't I think wonder that's... what's going to happen there if anybody actually tries that. New product idea? Our guest has been Jonathan Berry, founder and CEO of Goliath. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you both. Thank you to Christopher for producing and hosting, and thank you to our Patreon listener Slack group for their support and their questions. Of course, thank you for listening. You can always contact us at show at embedded.fm or hit the contact link on embedded.fm. And now I do not have a quote to leave you with. I think Jonathan has said it all. <laughs>